When I, I think about us being on that journey from Durban mm -hmm. to here, I know that there are some of us who are still carrying in our bellies um, this struggle. And for that, we are truly grateful to God. But I also come with a legacy understanding that um, there are those who have come before to the United Nations to bring this very issue. The National Negro Congress uh, brought their petition in 1946. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People did so in 1947. And the Civil Rights Council, let us be reminded, submitted the petition, We Charge Genocide, in 1951. And so this is not a new narrative. This is a very old narrative. I uh, thought deeply and prayerfully and decided that what I would attempt to bring to the conversation was a necessary focus around mass criminalization, selected immigration, and the race to take America back at this point in time. I think we all know that in the context of Afrophobia, underneath it is a racialized system of understanding that there is a hierarchy of human value and that hierarchy has African people at the bottom. It was embedded in the very Constitution of the United States as represented by the Three-Fifths Amendment. Of course, there have been various contestations to it, the Civil War, the Civil Rights Movement, and now the Black Lives Movement. All of those movements raise the question of how can you really have a true and sustainable democracy that is built upon a racialized hierarchy. I think for our purposes, we should acknowledge that the theology of a manifest destiny and the curse of Ham was very important as a part of the moral justification for that kind of hierarchy. And so we must also see that in response to that, in response to the Afrophobia, there's always been a constant retort, a retort from people of African descent. Ain't I your brother and sister in the 19th century, and I am a man, and black is beautiful in the 20th century, and black lives matter in the 21st century. And we are at another fork in the road. Right now, that fork is probably best understood um, in the moment of uh, the, the media that we live in, the moment of Charlottesville, in which we have the images of marchers espousing white supremacy and Nazism and white nationalism, also legally carrying armed weapons in open state. But then the global flashpoint of a United States president, which helped to normalize all of that. And so for us to understand, as the um, working uh, group of experts did, the significance of the war on drugs and mass incarceration upon people of African descent in the US, I think we want to offer here that we have moved from a moment of mass incarceration to a moment of mass criminalization. And mass criminalization then raises the question of what does it mean to have Afrophobia in the context of declaring a whole race of people to be centrally criminalized. And that means to racially dehumanize and target them, to name them as disposable and unworthy, to create a desensitizing of a collective cultural consciousness which normalizes extrajudicial killings with impunity, which allows for vigilante lynching of teens and unmerciful beatings of men or by men of adolescent girls in public classrooms. In short, mass criminalization is the making of the criminal the state of being black. And it does not matter how high or how low the mass movement of Black Lives Matter of youth who are attempting to protest a just cause is criminalized. The actions of a US black president is criminalized. And even the lynching effort of a biracial 10 year old boy is criminalized. What must we go through to come back 70 years later 
back to this body to again attest to our Africanity, our blackness, and our humanity, and our divinity within. But I want to say we will keep coming. We will keep coming. We will keep coming. And that brings us then to what could be a necessary and a predictable next step, which is the browning of America only deepening the Afrophobia. That browning of America was predicted 35 years ago, and then it was in May of 2012 in which the USA Today headline told us that the US had now more births of children of people of color than they did children of white parentage. And that is part of the basis of the DACA crisis that you have all heard about. That immigration policy was a selective policy from the beginning. It was grounded in an Afrophobia in which in 1803 there were laws which restricted black immigration. There was the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882 and there was an entire Asiatic barred zone from all of Asians. And then finally in 1986, there were questions of reform, but let's be very clear, when you dig deeply at those questions of reform, you find that Northern European nationals were favored and they were given backdoor access to the United States. And for sure, after 9-1-1, the 2001 U.S. Patriot Act turned the priority to Muslims, Muslims who are only 1% of a U.S. population. So the race to take America back is a race for securitization. And that is the big tent idea I want us to take away. Securitization is the new justification for the hierarchy of human value, racialized hierarchy of human value, Afrophobia undergirding that, related to mass criminalization and selective immigration and terrorism and a war on drugs, used by fear-mongering and the need to intimidate and control people of color. We, the church, must name it for what it is. It is evil. It is evil based on an othering process. The research has shown us that there are distinct markers that have a red flag going up, markers of disengagement in which a nation state begins to make moral justification. It begins to dehumanize the victims as an entire group and then it euphemistically labels the evil that it is engaged in. And so the scripture that I would bring is Jeremiah eight eleven. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious, peace, peace, they say when there is no peace. The scripture I would bring is Luke 24, 31, reminding us of a stranger in our gates. At that moment, open-eyed, wide-eyed, they recognized him and then he disappeared. So the question for the church is, as the physical survival, the spiritual divinity and human rights of people of African descent continue to be assaulted by Afrophobia, what saith? and what doeth the church. Mm -hmm. I submit that this is theological, it is ethical, it is moral, and it is a religious battle against evil. And we must, first of all, counter this ubiquitous dominion theology which undergirds it. Mm -hmm. A dominion theology which suggests that until the Christian church takes over the world, the world is unsafe. And so I offer a prescription, a prescription that is twofold. In the end, there must be a sacramental atonement and there also must be a transference of assets in the context of reparatory justice and reparations. Atonement begins with uh, the faith community supporting the truth-telling commissions that has already been talked about and that Proctor has already decided to engage in with others around the world. I want to underscore that truth-telling is sacred work. It begins with a look in the mirror, excavating, first of all, the role of faith in the transatlantic slave trade. And it brings us to the legacies of that participation in terms of the structures that we have inherited. 
But truth telling also does something for those of us who've been victimized. It affords us an opportunity of remembrance, a remembrance that helps us to affirm our humanity. This is the healing work that we must do. But we also must turn to reparatory justice. And what does justice look like? That's the question I always get. Well, let me tell you, justice looks like equitable investment in the educational system. Justice looks like disinvestment in private prisons and environmentally toxic wastelands. Justice looks like restorative investment in communities being devastated by policies of gentrification and land grabs. It looks like debt forgiveness for the rapes of nation states of people of African descent. And it looks like the establishment and the solicitation of contributions and the distribution of trust funds and investment funds in ways that support the 10-point plan of reparations of the National African American Reparations Commission and the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference MICA Fund. Indeed, justice looks like an African Marshall Plan. Mm -hmm. I would be amiss, finally, if I did not mention the complexity of Afrophobia as a psychological state of being. Afrophobia can now be measured by brain waves reflecting implicit bias, racialized beliefs, and by extension, racialized actions, such as, I felt threatened and therefore I killed him. Afrophobia will have to be illuminated and excavated at deeply visceral, spiritual, and psychosocial levels to obliterate the beliefs in the racial hierarchy of human value, beliefs in an idealized, blind, blue-eyed Jesus, figuratively and literally, as the quintessential author of divine authority. And so, as we leave here committed, ever committed to the creation of safe and liberated spaces, that allow us to reclaim the ancestral memory and to be bearers of hope. I hope that we put flesh on the bones of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. As Martin Luther King said to us nearly 50 years ago, we must stay in the struggle until the end. That is the 2018 theme of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference. I invite you to meet us in Memphis. God bless you.